No storm of life can knock you down with Jesus as your foundation. Find out what it means to build your life on the rock of Jesus. You know, if you decide that you're going to live in Florida, then you ought to be living in a house that's built differently from the way they're built in the north central states. If you live in a place that's vulnerable to hurricanes, and hurricanes do happen, the craziest thing happens with roofs in Florida. The same thing that happens to the airplane next time you take a plane ride. The reason why your plane gets up in the air is uh, properties of air called, uh, of the physics of air called lift, that when air is blowing past a plane wing, the plane wing rises up. The same thing happens to roofs, especially of nice, tidy, rectangular buildings. I happened to be in Orlando some years ago, right after Hurricane Rita went through central Florida, and I would say two-thirds of the houses uh, the week, in the week following had blue plastic tarps hanging over because there was roof damage. Also, if you are going to decide to live in Florida, make sure you have hurricane shutters on the outsides of your house. They can be nice and decorative, but when the storm is coming, you bring those babies together. And the third thing is, use concrete if possible, and even more than that, reinforce concrete. The concrete should have steel rebar in it, and build your house around that so that your house stays sitting on its foundation. Or what could happen to you is that whole thing could go down. Now, we're here today not to discuss building techniques in tropical climates where you're close to salt water, close to the Caribbean or to the, the Atlantic. What we are here to talk about is some words from Jesus about how to plan and build your personal life and your family life, and for those of you blessed to be married, especially your married life. But Jesus chose to use the metaphor of construction techniques to have you wrap your arms around how to go about this, what to do about this, how to think about this, why it matters, why it's important, what happens if you do it right, what happens if you don't do it right. And if Jesus said it, that automatically makes it important and needs to be up high on our priority list. So our Bible study today is going to be another one of my anxiety series, things I, f I worry about, things I stay up worrying about. Today I'd like to talk to you about building the vibe, building the relationship in your home. And this is true if you're single. If you're single, you have relatives, you have a home, even if they're not all living under the same roof. Managing your family relationships is not on autopilot. You have to choose how you are going to manage those relationships, realizing that, well, I mean, you might not have storms against you like uh, the hurricanes that come blowing off the, the, Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, but you will have an evil enemy in hell who's going to try to destroy you and your family. Be awake, be alert, and be listening. Jesus has some help for us. And I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 7. If you're alert... You hear Matthew 7 and you think, oh, that would be the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And you'd be absolutely correct. Three lengthy chapters, one of Jesus' longest discourses or speeches, a substantial amount of what he said on a sloped area north and west of the Sea of Galilee on one occasion was recorded for us. Possibly Matthew himself was an eyewitness and ear witness and wrote as fast as his little hands could take notes. And we have the benefit. Three chapters of steady talk from Jesus. And there's something you need to understand about the Sermon on the Mount. It is based on an assumption. The assumption is that everybody reading it is a believer. Because there's no instruction in the Sermon on the Mount on how to become a Christian. The conversion process of how God's power takes an unbeliever and converts her or converts him into being a believer. There's nothing about the blood atonement, uh, by, the way, by the way in which Jesus Christ offered his life as a payment for the sins of the world. Those are assumed that you know that stuff already. 
what Jesus is doing in these three chapters is essentially the same thing that his half-brother James did in his little letter towards the end of the New Testament. In five chapters, James, and in three chapters, Jesus, give us straight up, right in your face, in your grill, talk about how to live the way God wants you to live. And in fact, he's going to get rather strongly worded about it. Like, if you blow me off, if you, if you diss me in what I'm saying, don't expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa! Now, that might mess with your head a little bit because you maybe have been led to think that you are forgiven of your sins and made a candidate for heaven by faith alone, not by your works, which is so true. However, that in and of itself can be a dangerous statement if you don't attach along with it the fact that real faith, true faith, always shows itself in your life with deeds that are appropriate for someone who really is a child of God. If the Spirit of the Lord is living in your heart, you can automatically expect that there are going to be deeds that show your faith. You can't have the one without the other. You can't have authentic faith without Christian deeds or that your faith is just hypocrisy and gas. You're just a poser. You're you're just a faker. You're a hypocrite. On the other hand, there can be no such thing as deeds acceptable to God that are not also washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. For even our best deeds are flawed with selfishness and, uh, and strange and sometimes selfish motives. And so even our better moments need to be washed by Jesus, and they are. But what Jesus is going to say to us is a, a, a powerful warning against laziness, spiritual laziness that says, well, I've been baptized, so all my sins are washed away, I came to faith, I now am a believer in Christ, and so I can coast into heaven. I'm just going to skate home. And since everything's forgiven, I can live any way I want. I can enjoy myself, uh, no rules, no limits. I don't have to fear the devil anymore. I'm not scared to die. I don't have to fear hell. There's, don't have to fear judgment. I'm all clear and I can live any way I want. Because you've been forgiven does not give you license to go do it again. If you've been forgiven, that should change your hard heart. Now, that's what Jesus is getting at. At the end of Matthew 7, have you found the spot by now? I want you to go to verse 21. And, you know, sometimes this is a, an antidote, I think, to that notion or that picture of Jesus in your head is kind of like a spiritual Mr. Rogers, that he's kind of like this just kind of gentle kind of guy. Who, you know, he, he does, never gets anybody too upset and he just likes to be happy in his neighborhood and, and has talks about turning the other cheek, you know, and being sweet to everybody and saying some hard words that you can learn how to say. But he also talks like this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Anybody can talk religion. Anybody can say the name of Jesus. But he can sniff out who are the hypocrites, who's faking. He knows. You and I can partly tell people who are lying, but we don't know for sure. We can fool each other. We can fool our other people. We can even fool ourselves. Jesus will know right away who are the fakers. Just because you might have used religious language in your life does not make you one of God's children. This is a sharply worded rebuke to those who think that faith and a Christian life can be disconnected. Only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, on that, you know what day he's talking about, right? Judgment day. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? Well, the devil can counterfeit anything he wants. The devil has amazing power. Didn't we perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. And you know, uh, those are the ugliest, most horrible five words in anybody's language. Because if Jesus on Judgment Day says, away from me, that is your last chance. That is the last time you will hear the voice of God and you will be cast into outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is when you grind your teeth and say to yourself over and over, you are such an idiot. 
And the self-rebuke never stops. The hatred and loathing, the resentment, the blaming never stops. The Bible describes hell as the complete absence of God, the complete absence of anything good. That's what's at stake here. This is a big deal of the attitude you choose towards what God has revealed in his word. Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is now the wrap-up to three lengthy chapters, chapters I hope you have read, by the way. Have, have you heard the words of the Sermon on the Mount? Have you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Hmm. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house with rebar in his concrete, who put steel rafter straps on his roof, and who put storm shutters on his windows. Well, I, I actually made up that last part. That, that's, that's like what you would do if you lived in Florida. Jesus said, who built his house on a rock instead of on a swamp. Jesus says the way in which you live your life and the disciplines of building it the right way really matter because storms will come and blow your life apart if you don't do it right as you're, as you're building it. The rain came down, the streams rose like a storm surge, the winds blew 185 miles an hour, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation that was on the rock. Everyone else, uh, excuse me, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a fool who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. The end. That's how the Sermon on the Mount ends. Boom! And everybody's sitting there going. Kind of a sobering ending. Aren't you? They tell us at the seminary and sermon class always end on an upbeat note. You know, Jesus clearly skipped classes that day. That he's, he he ends with a like a fist. You know, it's fist shaking. Ooh, keepers. You believe him? He's telling you something you need to hear. And that is that obedience matters. Faith matters, but obedience matters along with it. This is based on the idea, build your house around the idea of your creator. God isn't asking to be let into your life. He's let you into his world. You're just noticing it. Hi, my name is Jason Nelson. I've had the privilege of writing many Grace Moments devotions and several books for Time of Grace. My recent book is entitled Keeping the Last Promise. And in it I share some very personal lessons I've learned about addiction and recovery. So I wrote this book for two reasons. One is to provide some camaraderie. If you know somebody who is battling to be unpossessed by drugs or alcohol, you are not alone and you don't need to feel ashamed. I also wrote this book to sketch out a little framework for hope. We found hope that enabled our loved one to begin to put his life back together. And recovering people need the power of God's grace in their lives. And when they have that, they have the ability to keep their last promise to remain sober for one more day. Thanks so much for your gift to help connect more people to God's amazing grace. Organize your life around the idea, I've been created I've been made. I didn't make myself. I was designed. I have a master blueprint for me. And even though my body may get old and saggy and weak and frail, I've got DNA that's got the ideal snapshot, the picture of how I look in my prime. And when I wake up from the dead, that's what I'm going to look like. No more glasses, no more toupee, no more prosthetic limbs, no more replacement organs. I'm going to come back 100%. My design, my blueprint is perfect. That's the perfect me that's going to live in heaven. I've been built for fellowship with God. I'm built to be part of his world. I'm built to interact with my daddy in heaven. And we ran away, but I've been converted and brought back. The Spirit of the Lord brought me back to reconnect me with my Father in heaven. I've been 
washed by the blood of Jesus. He gives me such value. In Colossians 3, St. Paul is explaining to you how do you build your life to last? How do you build on the rock? How do you build with steel straps holding your roof on so that your roof won't blow off when the troubles of life come? Realize you are holy and dearly loved. Everybody wants to be chosen. Nobody wants to be rejected. Who wants rejection? I can't stand it. I run from it. I fear it. God gives me the feeling that I am somebody. God gives you the sense of being worth something. That he not only made you, he remade you. He poured out the blood of his son with his anger at our evil and sin and he punished him instead of you. What does that say about how valuable you are to your heavenly father? What does that say how badly Jesus wants to spend eternity with you? He wants you with him in his house. He's not going to just enjoy heaven all by himself. He wants you there to share it with him. He wants to enjoy you and wants you to enjoy him. The Spirit of the Lord reveals his wisdom to you so that you got something in your head other than fresh air. And he gives you a spine and a backbone so that you can choose to live God's way instead of following the whispers and lies that the devil is putting at you to massage your appetites, feed your resentments, keep you angry, keep you cranky, keep you self-pitying, keeping you self-centered and egotistical, keep you bragging and smug, or keep, or worse, the, the opposite of smugness and bragging, keeping you so insecure and feeling so shaky and anxious all the time that you don't like yourself. In fact, you hate yourself. That every time the devil gets a human being to hate herself, or hate himself. He's laughing in hell. Got another one. And she's going to wreck a lot of other lives because she doesn't even like herself. God gives you the ability to like yourself. Now organize your life around God's vision of you and everything changes. Jesus says, everyone who hears my words, that's job one. Are you listening to Jesus? To build your house on the rock means you're listening to the word. Nobody can do that for you. Only you can open up your ears. Only you can open up your heart. Jesus won't, can't even and won't even do that for you. He did it once to convert you. Now you must choose to be in the Word. You must choose to go to church. You must choose to crack your Bible. Nobody else can do it for you. Whoever hears my Word, choose to hear the word. It's life or death. Don't wait till judgment day to see if cracking your Bible is a good plan. By then it will be too late. The day of your death, which could be this afternoon, will be too late. Hear the words of mine and put them into practice. Do you, for instance, do you know the Ten Commandments? Which is God's pretty amazing, concise summary of his will for humanity. Do you? Do you? Could you say could you say all 12 of them? <laughs> Do your children know them? Yes? Could your children sit down? If they're, let's say, second grade or older, could they sit down and, and say or write them out for you? Yes? No? Uh-oh. How can you obey what you don't even know? Why don't they know? Maybe they've not been hearing. Take this seriously. This is a big deal. If you want to build your house on the rock to last, it means remembering who you are. You were created for fellowship with God. You know, a bachelor named Paul wrote what I think is some of the best family advice I have ever heard, and I think about it all the time, and I keep working at myself to try to tune myself up more with what he said. He's a bachelor, but he knows more about marriage than I ever have. He had no children, and yet he knows more about parenting, I think, than I ever did, thanks to what the Spirit revealed. But in Colossians chapter 3 are amazing words. I referenced the first sentence for you already, to remember that you're holy and dearly loved. You can like yourself because God likes you. You are holy and pure in God's eyes because your debts have all been paid off. You're free and clear. That heavy weight of, of condemnation has been lifted off you. You're somebody now. So li live like somebody, act like somebody. And Paul gave five powerful words, and these are my takeaways for you, how to 
build your relationships in your home and within your family along these five lines. Take just these five, and you're going to be amazed at how much better your life is. Number one is to, be, to show compassion to the people around you. That means your compassion is from two Latin words that mean to suffer along with somebody. You're willing to bear someone else's pain. Man, I don't like to do that. I'll tell you straight up with you right now. I don't like to do that. That's work. I got enough mess in my life. I don't need any of your mess in my life. I got plenty of my own. I got plenty to spare. But do it anyway. After all, did not Jesus Christ bear up your sorrows? Didn't he carry your infirmities, bear the blow given to you? In other words, treat other people the way Jesus treats you. Compassion means you got time for other people's problems in your family. And you listen and carry it. That means husbands, and here, chief of sinners, uh, right here, number one. I'm sinner number one in this regard. But that means, husbands, when you say to your wife, how are you doing, honey? How was your day? That means stop what you're doing so she can tell you. Instead of, instead of hoping for a one-word one answer like, fine. What if she really wants to tell you? Compassion means you will carry her frustration on your heart and care about what's hurting her. Second, an awesome example, is kindness. Kindness means you treat somebody better than he or she deserves. Kindness means you're nice to people who aren't very nice to you. Kindness means you don't retaliate and play revenge games. You don't count up score and decide what each other has coming or what he or she deserves in your home. Kindness means you are nicer to people than they are to you. And man, that's hard, isn't it? Just do it. That is how you build your house upon a rock. And what you will find is that kindness, instead of wrecking the, the trading game, the business of relationships, that kindness actually releases kindness in other people. The third thing that Paul gave us to work on is humility, is cultivating the attitude of a servant, taking the risk that by meeting someone else's needs, your needs will get met, taking the risk of being used as a doormat or taken advantage of, taking the risk of enabling bad behavior because you are going to show somebody uh, kindness and meet their needs and make their happiness and well-being even more important than your own. Got a ways to go on that myself. I'm not there yet. I'm working on it. Keep me accountable, okay? Don't let me get away with bad behavior. The fourth that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Paul mentions is gentleness. Watch your mouth. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. Angry words that you throw out there, you may say a day later, hey, you know, I didn't mean what I said yesterday. And you might just think, oh, it never happened. You know, I didn't mean it. Angry, hard, accusing words that you say will stick like arrows in people's backs and they can't ever pull them out. If, you, if, if a woman makes her man feel small and stupid, he will never be sure if she respects him ever again, ever, ever again. A husband who makes his wife feel ugly will never, she never again can trust that he thinks she's pretty. Be careful of what comes out of your mouth. Keep your voice soft and do not allow misunderstandings to turn into arguments or fights. The fifth one is patience. Cut each other some slack in your home. Parents, you know you need to cut your kids slack. They're working on their game. They're coming up. They'll be all right. They just need some time. But you know what? Grown-ups need some, some slack too. Husbands and wives are working on their game and it's harder than it looks. It's, marriage is more fun than it looks. It's also, I'm here to tell you, it's harder than it looks. Uh, chief of the reasons being me because I bring sin into the relationship but then so does my partner and so do those of you who are married so does your partner patience means you're going to cut each other some slack because God's pounding on us with his hammer on the anvil bam bam mark bam your head is hard man bam 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 and you got to wait until we're like straightened out a little bit it takes time we're works in progress and patience means okay you disappointed me today but tomorrow's going to be better and choose to believe in that better tomorrow. And in this way, that person will cut you some slack. 
And above over all these virtues, put on love, Paul says, and forgive as the Lord forgave you. In other words, in summary, treat each other and especially the people in your home the way God in Christ has chosen to treat you. That's a pretty good guideline. That's what Jesus means when he says, first, hear my words, listen to the game plan, and then do it. Obedience matters. Do it. And in this way, you will build a structure that Satan will have a hard time blowing over when he and his nasty breath come and try to knock your life down and blow it apart. This is good news for God's people because there is hope for us all. We have the washing of forgiveness for our millions of mistakes in the way we've been doing things. But hey, as long as you're still standing, Satan hasn't won yet. And that means it's time to retrofit our homes and our houses in the way we act. But there's time. So today is the first day of the rebuild of your home. And as you have heard what Jesus says and what the Scripture says in Uh, through the words of St. Paul, now is your chance not just to hear it, but blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. Amen.